Hi guys, Beach Clean Gamer here. <clears throat> a new packet today. Only short, sweet this video. Let's get it opened, shall we? And see what it's all about. I actually forgot I ordered these because I think it took about two weeks to arrive. <clears throat> Here we go. From 8 bit 2, uh, it makes you, the original Sega Mega Drive 6 button pads Bluetooth, which I can't wait to try out. Hold on one sec. Open it up. <clears throat> There's the instructions. Really easy to do. What do we have here? Okay. There's your USB lead. USB to mini USB. Give you a screwdriver, and there's the actual kit there. And that just goes in the original six button Sega pad. Uh, I've got two here as well, one's for my nephew. Uh, so I'm going to be getting one for the Super Nintendo as well, and hopefully, they'll do a PC Angel one, Bluetooth. So Little unboxing of it. Hope you like. See you later. Hi guys, Beach Clean Gamer here. Uh, just straight into it now. I'll just show you what I picked up today. I am absolutely over the moon. I had this back when it first came out on the uh, Jack Dreamcast. Went 99, 2000. And here it is. Look at this beauty. <sighs> Shenmue 1 and 2. The Xbox Remastered, I can't wait to play this. Quick little video, now I'm off the beach to go and fly my disco drone. So I'll do a little video of that, and I'll just attach it to this. Uh, so it's going to be, well it's going to be like a triple header because there's an un other unboxing video before it as well. So, okay guys, I can't believe this, Shemu 2, tier 1 and 2, how'd you do? Woo! AllFightingArts.com and I'm talking with someone who has... Um made quite a mark as a Bruce Lee historian, as a writer. John Little, I'm uh, very pleased to talk with you, John. Thank you for doing this. Oh, my pleasure, Ken. We'd emailed a little bit prior to our talking today, and when I was reading some of the material on your website, I thought, you know what, I, we have probably a very similar background in terms of what influenced us, what got us involved in some degree, some greater, some lesser, in martial art. And... Uh, so I'm interested in exploring some of those with you. Yeah, me too. How did you become interested in martial arts originally? Oh, well, the same way you did. I watched the Kung Fu TV series. <laughs> and back in, well, I guess it came out in late 72. Um, and I don't know when I saw it. It was probably, it had to be in 72 at some point because, or very early 73. I'd just never seen anything like that. And, and like you, I think what impressed me the most was this, philosophy that was the the source of a lot of the action sequences. The action sequences were good. They were physical, and, and but there was a certain uh, grace to the movements and a, and a relaxed, just, I won't say effortless, but uh, I mean, those who know Chinese thought will understand Wu Wei, but that's kind of what I was perceiving at the time without really knowing what it was. And mm -hmm. I love the interplay and the, and the moral teachings that came from that. So we never had anything like that on television, and no. certainly not in our childhood education that I could compare it to. And it was it, there was a depth to that that I hadn't seen in other television shows, which were on, you know, in and around the same time. And it, how old were you at this time? Uh, I was twelve. Oh, so you're a little younger than I am. Oh yeah, I'm an old guy. <laughs> I, was, I was born in 1960, so I'm 50 this year. So I don't know. It was probably the right time. You know, as a young, impressionable male, you're looking. 
looking for answers in some respects and looking for role models. And Kung Fu was the, the first series that did it. And I became a huge David Carradine fan at that point. And it was through my fascination with that TV show that I first was exposed to Bruce Lee because uh, I was up at a little cottage up in northern Ontario and there wasn't much to do and I was bored and we went into town and I was a voracious magazine reader and the first issue of Fighting Stars came out on the stand. Oh, sure. I, I think I had that. Yeah, I still have it. Uh, I didn't, don't have my original one. My brother, many, many decades ago, threw it out on me, but I, I secured another copy of it. But I bought it because it had an article on TV's Master Poe, which was played by Key Luke. And I thought, oh, cool, you know, Kung Fu TV series. And on the cover <laughs> of it was Bruce Lee uh, and Bob Wall uh, in their famous fight scene from Enter the Dragon. And Oh, yeah. As soon as I opened it up, there was a notice that Bruce Lee had passed away, and I thought, well, who is this guy? And I realized that he was Cato, which I vaguely remembered. I was more of a Batman fan when the Green Hornet came out. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but I thought, okay, well, there's an association. This is the guy that played Cato. And uh, the more I read about it, the more impressed I was. And they talked about this movie, Enter the Dragon, that was forthcoming. And then when the movie came out, I went and saw that. and. Instantly, David Carradine receded from my vision, uh, replaced by Bruce. Wasn't that amazing, the feeling that we had back then when he came on the screen, especially to me, the fight in the in the dungeon oh, yeah. with all the people. I, I'd i never seen anything as beautiful in my life, I don't no. think. And, I mean, it's, there, there are things that, I mean, while maybe the magic may have worn off a little bit, there was there's still something about that that holds up when you watch it. Like, Enter the Dragon, to me, was, without sounding Star Trekian, uh, was a life-changing moment. Uh, I came out of that theater a different person than I went into it. And for the next, oh, eight, nine years, you know, Bruce Lee became my sole point of interest. If we were going to have a conversation, if I couldn't work Bruce Lee into it somehow, we weren't having a conversation. <laughs> And uh, I was very interested and, of course, bought all the books when they came out. And I think the first, one of my happiest moments was when uh, Linda Lee's uh, Bruce Lee, The Man Only I Knew came out, which was a yes. paper bag and they had little flip book action photos in it of Bruce. But when I was reading it, I was so hungry to find out what made this guy what he was. And we got to sort of, Linda sort of took us there by steps and, and she presented some of his early essays on yin yang and almost Taoist philosophy, which really resonated even at that age. Uh, I was probably 15 then when I was reading that, but there was, it, it was like an onion. You know, the more you peeled off of it, the more there was. And, and I was just fascinated. Bruce Lee had been the first, well, I'll say, hero that I had growing up that, unlike some heroes, when you crank up the resolution on the microscope, you see lots of chips in the plaster. And with Bruce Lee, I didn't see any of that. I mean, he was, you know, a tremendous fighter by all accounts. He was in tremendous physical condition. He was a good-looking guy, and he was very successful, and he was smart and, and philosophical. And it's the first time I'd ever seen anybody, especially someone that young, that had sort of all facets of their, you know, human potential uh, pretty much fully realized. And that was, that was intriguing. So how did you become the only person allowed complete access to his notes and, and papers and letters? Um, how, did, how did you meet the family from that point? At the time, I was, I was working in California. I was writing for Joe Weider's magazine. I was a senior writer at Flex magazine, and, and we also did articles for Muscle and Fitness, which were under the same banner. And uh, we did you know the usual things that writers do. We talked to bodybuilders, and we covered contests, and at the time, I think, it would have been probably around 1993, which is when the movie Dragon came out. And, of course, I went and saw that, and it just it reignited my interest in Bruce Lee because there had been nothing on Bruce Lee for quite a number of years at that point. So, you know, you, you get thinking about you know, old memories you had when you're in a theater watching it and old books or photographs that you'd seen. And, and I thought, geez, you know, one thing about Bruce Lee that I was always intrigued by was his physical conditioning his tremendous physique, his strength. And I happen to be writing now for a magazine that explores these areas. Wouldn't it be interesting to look into this subject? And when we were growing up, and you may have had the same experience, in the 70s, there was a martial arts studio, typically a karate one, on every street corner. Uh, sure. up like mushrooms. And 
if you went in there and they caught a whiff that you were a Bruce Lee fan, um, they had you, you know, uh, because they would just <laughs> say that, you know, well, yeah, well, Bruce did this or he borrowed from this. And you'd look at the instructors and say, you know, I want to get in better physical condition. Well, I'll do this. This is what Bruce Lee did, you know, and, and we ate that up with a spoon, you know. But what became evident over time was that Bruce Lee had a different body than these people. So it wasn't just martial arts that was the answer to that. He obviously did something else, and, and that piqued my interest. So anyway, after a lot of back and forth at the magazine, because they weren't really that interested in the article, uh, they agreed that I could write this. And that gave me license to an entree to speak to the people that had worked out with Bruce Lee and had trained with him, who knew him. And so that was like a kid in a candy store. It was awesome. I got to speak to everybody from... Bolo to June Ree to Bruce's first generation students and on the hope that she would speak with me I, I also um, contacted Linda and it probably was through one of the students who knew her and she was very gracious and agreed to, to be interviewed about Bruce's training methods and had sent me some wow. photocopied materials of the, I think one or two of his workout programs and it was fascinating I mean uh, I spent so much time in that article because uh, I had been on the outside looking in for so many years that I had full empathy with the reader. I wanted to make sure everything was accurate, everything was exactly what he did. And magazines being magazines, if an ad comes in at the 11th hour, part of the article has to be trimmed. And so certain elements were cut out of the article. And I was, you know, gutted at that because I'd waited so long to get this out and I felt I, you know, I really wanted to uh, sort of do right by Bruce on that. So when I was speaking with Linda, I said, ah, you know, bad news. You know, part of it got cut out. It's really too bad. I said, you know, we've got enough material here. I said, actually, that didn't make it in the article. It could have made uh, probably for a good book. And she said, well, why don't you write it? And I thought, wow, that would be cool. And anyway, one thing led to another, and, and she asked me to come out to Idaho where she was living. And as soon as I stepped off the plane, she handed me three volumes of Bruce's writings, um, the writings that he did when he was injured, when his back was injured, and said, here, this should get you started. And I remember I checked into the Double Tree Hotel there, and I felt I was hold, you know, handling holy writ, you know, because these <laughs> things that Bruce had written on, and I was just beside myself. And then over the course of the weekend, we went to her storage locker, and she opened it up. And Anyway, uh, fast forwarding, she then suggested that we move to Idaho, uh, my wife and I and children, and uh, there we set up an office and took all of Bruce's stuff out of storage, and I was sort of entrusted with the job of, you know, organizing and putting his books up on library shelves, which, you know, we bought and assembled, and, and then for the next five years, about eight hours a day, I was going through Bruce's papers, and it ended up being, wow. I think it was supposed to be a 12-volume series, and it ended up being, I think, a seven- or eight-volume series. I can't remember at this point. So uh, which book was first? Because I I pulled out The Art of Expressing the Human Body last night, and I was a bit surprised that it still has the Amazon.com receipt in it, and I'd ordered it December 24th, 1998. Yeah. That's, uh, I, I didn't realize it was so long ago. Oh, yeah. These books, I mean, I think, geez, you know, now this is going back. I, I have no idea of the actual date. I know that before I left California for Idaho, we had signed our agreement with Tuttle, so that probably would have been 1995. The first three books that came out, I believe, were The Tao of Kung Fu, uh, Jeet Kune Do, Bruce Lee's Commentaries on the Martial Way, and I think Letters of the Dragon. Like, no, I, and I could be wrong about that. Letters might have been the next year. Uh, it might have been the press interviews might have been the first one, Words of the Dragon. Um, but I, I believe The Tao of Kung Fu was, was one of the first, and I think the Jeet Kune Do book was another one and then the conditioning or the training book came out after that so you worked on these for several years and i've i've got a stack of books in front of me as we're talking here and all of them are are there and the warrior within which mm. uh, is, is your book. okay I, I, that one might have been 95 and that was again sort of a you know an homage to his philosophy i i didn't feel then and, and i wouldn't feel now qualified to write a definitive book on his martial art technique, but the philosophy I really liked because it was it was the source that informed everything he did, from movie decisions to choreography to his martial pursuits to business decisions to relationships. So to me, that that was a very powerful river that was coursing through his 
mine, and I wanted to understand it more. So I'd gone through a lot of um, his press interviews, and I'd done some uh, some additional research into his his essays and things like that, and then thought, okay, now if someone who, as you know, kung fu doesn't mean you know someone who's just a great uh, martial artist. It, it, it means self mastery. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it can be expressed in anything. You can be a carpenter and have terrific kung fu. So I thought, well, that's such an interesting term. And self-mastery certainly has to proceed from uh, from man's thoughts, from his mind, because we're a thinking animal. And so let's take a look at, uh, you know, how what Bruce's, Bruce Lee's philosophy was to uh, bring about this, uh, at least attempt at self-mastery or, or kung fu. So that was the premise of that book. Actually, it's funny, you know, looking back on it, I think there's a lot of, of good material there and, and an interesting way of looking at life. It sure is. And in reading these books, looking through them uh, in the past 24 hours to prepare for this conversation, I I just found myself getting inspired again, just like I did when I opened up the Tao Jeet Kune Do back in around 1974, I think it was. It's, uh, I remember when my uncle bought me that, I think for my birthday, um, the Tao of Jeet Kune Do. And it was like, whoa, this is the book. You know, I couldn't wait. You know, it's Bruce's writing, Bruce's sketches. And I remember the time, once I'd gone through it, thinking, whoa, I must be really stupid, because this makes no sense to me whatsoever. <laughs> and, you know, it was only later that I kind of realized that a lot of those writings were taken from different periods of his development and kind of thrown into a, a stew of sorts, you know, and... Uh, those who had studied his art or who were adept at his his biography and understood it, probably it would have made more sense to them. But for me, I was seeing things from classical Chinese you know, martial arts to this very liberated, free-form philosophy, uh, which seemed to me incompatible uh, at the time. And But I was still intrigued by it. I mean, it was a big book. And, and it was only years later, I remember talking with Ted Wong about it one day, we were sitting in my office, and I said, you know, that is a, it's almost an, a malapropism, I said, the, the title of the book, because Jeet Kune Do, Do means way, you know, way of the intercepting fist, the Tao of Jeet Kune Do means the way of the way of the intercepting fist. <laughs> it, was, it was a strange uh, title on it. In fact, Bruce's, um, Bruce probably would have called it Tao of, you know, Tao of Jeet Kune, but more importantly, it was his commentaries on the Marshall Way, which is where we got our subtitle for the Jeet Kune Do book. That was how he labeled his six volumes or seven volumes of notes that he wrote when he was injured. The last book, I believe, was that Striking Thoughts? Yeah, I think that was one of the last ones that came out. Is is your journey through this material complete? Is there anything else coming up? Um, to my knowledge, there's nothing else uh, coming up. Because I tell you, I've walked into bookstores for several years, always checking the martial arts rack to, to see if anything that you have written is, is showing up new. Yeah. No, um, we, I returned to Canada in 2001. There were some, some issues with uh, Tuttle and the, the estate had sort of changed, the Bruce Lee estate had, had sort of changed. Linda had um, sort of stepped back from that to get on with her life, and justifiably so. Um, and things sort of got put on hold, and they just never got taken off hold. But uh, I think in all candor, there isn't really much more that can be brought out. And I remember actually speaking with Linda about that at one point. She said, do you think there's anything else that you know, can be written about? The only things I could think of were were books that would certainly be minor parts of the Bruce Lee oeuvre. You know, it would be his art, because he was a very accomplished artist his sketches, and, and there were some Chinese writings that could be translated and published, but most of those were written, I think, during his early years, and probably were, were written because they didn't really have photocopies, you know, back then. So for his own edification and, and knowledge, he, he was a very aggressive note uh, taker. And then I also thought The Art of the Fight Scene would be an interesting book, where we looked at his choreography writings, but you know, as far as Bruce Lee, I mean, the essence of what he was about, I think really there's anything significant has already been written about. I mean, anything else would really be an echo of that in some way, shape, or form. You know, when I think of him, I not only think of the skill, um, but I think of the philosophy and the uh, insight into Taoist thought and, and just a sense of peace that 
I got from some of his writings, but did Bruce Lee have much peace in his life in the short time he lived? Um, well, you know, in true yin-yang fashion, I think it, it, there was alternating periods of, of peace and, and turmoil. You know, and that's, that's just the human experience. And I, I think it's just that way for everybody's life. It may have been that near the end of his life, it was certainly a little more hectic and uh, the waters were a little more choppy, but I think they probably would have become a little more placid as time went on. He was one yeah. of the few people I've really seen or studied that, that was true to his philosophy, whose philosophy basically, he lived it. Uh, there's people that can often profess a philosophy, but to live by it is, is something uh, different altogether. But he, I mean, even in his private time, I mean, he was writing essays, like in my own process. And that's a guy that is is saying, you know, almost as an affirmation to himself, you know, to, to honestly express yourself, to introspect, to find out what it is that makes me me. So even during, you know, the sort of the, the darkest hours, or if you will, not that they were dark, but, you know, times where his life was very complicated, you know, different movie studios wanting him, you know, what decision do I make? Is this right? And, and stewing over every nuance of a fight scene to make sure that it was authentic and, and honest and exciting at the same time, uh, he was trying to find out who he was and stay centered. And that, uh, you know, that to me tells me that he was, you know, someone who lived by his philosophy. But like, a, like any human being, you're not adverse to bad situations occurring, good situations occurring, and you tend to ebb and flow with those. And if you happen to be yeah. philosophically centered, like he was, you tend to be able to ride the waves you know, with a little more ease and, and calm. But, yeah, um, I, I would say probably his life got very complicated and hectic near the end of it. But from what I could gather in reading some of the writings that he did in the final year of his life, he seemed, he seemed pretty level-headed. Yeah, it just seemed like a, his life was quite an example of believing in yourself, setting goals, and then having a almost a single-minded purpose to achieving those goals yeah. and you see that you see that played out again and again in in the lives of great people uh, people who have achieved great things well that's true and and uh, his big thing was quality that's one thing i always in fact if someone asked me about bruce lee and i find myself referring to this quite a bit when you when you are in business for yourself or if you work and one of those things was not to look for short end gain or money um but to do quality stuff to make sure it's, you're into it 100% and doing the best that you can because in Bruce's words, if the quality is there, money will follow and money is important obviously in providing for your family and uh, not having a you know a sword of Damocles hanging over your head, uh, you know, worried that you're going to lose your house or this or that and, and his big thing was quality you've got to do it to the best of your ability and that's a pretty good lesson and that's, that's pretty much what he did, martial arts were his his work if you will and he worked very hard at it we see a lot of people that, you know, want Bruce Lee-like results, but they're not willing to put in Bruce Lee-like hours to achieve them. And yeah. you just can't do it without doing that. What's the state of Jeet Kune Do today? And the, the original students are, some have passed away, and they're getting up there in years at this point. But has Jeet Kune Do progressed? In many respects, it it all really depends on the individual practicing the art and, and whether or not they get it. Uh, yeah. And if they get it, then the only progression is their individual progression that's important. And sometimes you can't use that as a litmus test for an art's progression. It's a, it's a, it's a unique art in the sense that it's very, very individual. Um, not individual in the sense that you do whatever the hell you want, but that you, you develop those human attributes to their fullest capacity and you find out what tools to borrow one of Bruce's phrases um, you would you know are in your arsenal and which ones are well forgive me there's a playing in the plan really low <laughs> <laughs> incoming um, and when you cultivate those tools and train them enough they the ideas basically make them reflexive so if you find yourself in a situation you react to it like echo to sound there are people that simply think it's doing those techniques, achieving a certain degree of proficiency in those techniques, and that's cheap to do. And there's others that perhaps take the pendulum too far to the other side and say it's it's kind of do what you want. 
And it's none of those things. Mm-hmm. It's a very, I think it's, well, it is one of the reasons he closed his schools, is that it's not a mass art. It's not something you can, you know, take in the aggregate and, you know, rubber stamp a bunch of people and say, yes, they get this, or no, they don't get that. It's a very individual thing. I mean, to me, it was almost like uh, in the final stages of Bruce's development there, it was, it was almost like having a psychotherapist come to visit you at your house. If you look at, you know, the backyard footage of he with James Coburn and listen to his voiceovers when he's talking about it, that is like no martial art I've ever seen. You know, get over that self-consciousness. Just throw yourself into it 100%. You know, be reflexive. Don't, don't think about it. Don't contemplate it. React to it. And those were lessons he tried to teach even then Enter the Dragon with that finger pointing to the moon analogy. You know, don't think, feel. It's a, it's a very... He was, I don't know, he was like a traveling you know, country doctor, and his little black bag con- consisted of an air shield, focus mitts, and a few other things, and he would use those physical tools, if you will, or, or medical instruments to try and, and heal the patient from whatever he was suffering from. And most times it was some really strong sense of um, self-consciousness. Uh, people, I don't want to you know, do a kick like that, I'd look like an idiot, or I can't do it. And, you think, get over it, get over it, just express it, do it, and you'll be surprised what you have within you. That was you can now, go in the you, final analysis. But, you know, if you take a snapshot of Bruce in 1960, when he was with Jesse Glover, say, or, or Taki Kimura, and then take a look at him by 66 when he's at Long, you know, when he's in uh, with Jimmy Lee and those people, and then 67 when he's opened the Chinatown School, and 1970 when he's doing private teaching and things like that, but they're... They're different animals at that point. You know, the the one, the first earlier stage was he wanted to create a super, you know, gung fu system, a a Chinese gung fu system. So it was all the Chinese arts, and you read in his writings that, you know, these are the 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 distilled wisdom of four thousand years of, uh, you know, Chinese pugilism. And then later it was, you know, he started to create his own art, which was predicated on uh, the technique of interception, stop hitting. You know, stop picking, things like that, and that's how the Jeet from Jeet Kune Do got its name. And then later, you know, his post Krishnamurti period, he he was profoundly impacted by the thought that a way of doing something is a cage, it's a restriction, and therefore, if you create a way, even a way of the intercepting fist, you've created a box, and you you know you don't want to just have an art based on interception. You want it to be a totality of everything. Any you know, combative possibility. So do you still, do you study? Uh, yeah. Well, I studied with uh, Ted Wong for a period when I was uh, in Los Angeles, and I was writing the books because I thought, you know, I've got to, I've got to have a mechanical working knowledge of these, of the physical component. But uh, I was probably, I think it's safe to say, Ted's worst student um, that he's ever had. Uh, at that point, <laughs> I was older. I mean, if I'd if I'd known about Ted Wong and or people who were teaching his art at that point, uh, you know, when I was 15 or 16, I mean, I would have been into that in a huge way. But uh, at that point, from my vantage point regarding martial arts, is a couple of statements actually Bruce made, uh, which sort of echoed my perception on it. Which was in Enter the Dragon when he said, you know, uh, why doesn't somebody pull out a 45, you know, and settle it. And in the Pierre Burton interview, he said, nowadays you don't go around on the street punching and kicking people because if you do, you know, someone will pull out a gun and shoot you. <laughs> and it dawned on me that martial art per se has evolved considerably from when it was, you know, when you're using field implements for <laughs> in Okinawa to knock horsemen off their mounts and, and to have a wide horse stance and, uh, you know, tell someone to put their dukes up because you're going to, you're going to engage in an honorable, you know, bare knuckle fight. It's 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 evolved to the point now where you can wipe out an entire country with a push of a button. And most encounters on the street, you don't know how many people are going to be involved. You don't know if your opponent has a weapon. So it kind of dawned on me when I was in my 20s, actually, and I was studying. Uh, well, back then it was karate, but uh, I'm training and I'm putting in all these hours in the perfection and cultivation of techniques that I'm never going to use because. I'm not getting in fights. Uh, right. You know, I'm not looking to get in fights. I'm not. Uh, I have no desire to in, you know, to hurt somebody, and I have no desire to be hurt. And um, on a certain level, I don't know that anybody, honestly, needs to be taught uh, means and ways to hurt people. 
I think we have that in us in a very we couldn't have survived as a species unless we knew how to protect ourselves you know to some level and the human mind again has been put to work to the point where now we have you know if you want to talk about the ultimate in simple direct and efficient it's the squeezing of a trigger in a handgun you know I think we uh, we look at some things quite similarly I I've been involved in martial arts for 38 years now and the last thing I want to do is hurt somebody and I also don't believe you have to be hurt in order to train this this stuff but it's but it became more of an art after a while you know what? I hear you and I'm absolutely on the same page as you are expressing yeah. the human body is as good a way to put it as anything yeah, and I, you know for that reason it's funny I've always had a soft spot for Tai Chi and I studied it for a little bit and more recently, I've been very interested in uh, Wing Chun, and not necessarily because Bruce Lee at one point, you know, practiced it pretty rigorously. I just I like the art component, and at my age um, and station in life, I'm, I'm looking at it as an art. So it's you know, like one might take up the piano or glass blowing. Uh, this I just happen to like it, and if a side effect of that is that my chances of defending myself successfully are a little better than what they would have been had I not studied it. Uh, that's great. You know, it's a nice side effect. But that's not why I'm doing it. You know, I like I like the elements of coordination, balance, and developing other aspects of my human potential that I think a martial art gives to me. And you know, it's funny. Do you remember um, one of the, I think one of the greatest lines in that Longstreet TV series that Bruce was in wasn't spoken by Bruce. It was by James Franciscus. The last thing he said to uh, to Bruce to try and get him to teach him again. And it was something to the effect that, you know, it's oddly that out of a, a martial art, out of combat, I could, you know, find something peaceful, tranquil yeah. almost, and that it was almost, he said, uh, as if I knew Jeet Kune Do, it would be enough simply to know it, and by knowing it, not, never have to use it. And I, just, I sure. thought, wow, oh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> <That's very laughs> I cool. think I have that episode on yeah. tape. Powerful words and a very strong endorsement as to why I think martial arts still can play uh, an integral role in one's life. So are you still writing, and what are, what are you doing these days? What's your next project? My, my interest probably for the past 10 years has been on looking for rational scientific reasons underpinning how human beings should exercise. And I was fortunate to hook up with a medical doctor out of South Carolina who has a similar interest, and in my estimation is probably the brightest mind I've encountered in the field of exercise. And we did a book together called Body by Science, and the idea was to throw out all our prejudices and preconceived notions and traditions about how humans should exercise and look at what the medical evidence actually suggests. And what we found out, uh, in a nutshell, was that you really don't need to train more than about 12 to 15 minutes once every seven days, but you have to do a type of training that engages all elements of your metabolism, not just one subsegment of it. And uh, so I've been interested in that. Uh, and that's been my interest. In fact, we opened two two fitness centers here where I live, and we train people one on one. I mean, it, <laughs> uh, at the risk of sounding silly, it's kind of like the Jeet Kune Do concept in Bruce's later stages applied to exercise. Interesting. What what are the names of your fitness centers? Uh, it's called Nautilus North Strength and Fitness Center. Nautilus, like the shell, which is kind of okay. cool too, because if you look at a Nautilus shell, especially one that's been you know, cut in half, you see these little chambers from where it started to where it yeah, where it evolved. And I've subsequently come to learn that it's a great, uh, for some, a great spiritual uh, icon because it represents the growth and evolution of, of an individual. And I thought, well, that's not an inappropriate uh, logo. It also happens to be the name of the equipment that we use in the gym. When you look back at your years doing this project, uh, book after book on Bruce Lee, what what comes to your mind? What, how do you feel about all the time you've spent and what you've done for his legacy? Uh, well, it's not for me to say what I've, how I feel I've done for his legacy. But, um, but I, I, from my own personal vantage point, it was a tremendous uh, privilege for me to do that. I felt very honored to do that and to look at papers that only you know Bruce himself was the last one to see. It was, but it, it was weird in a way. It was kind of like you know Plato's cave analogy, you know, where there's most people are sort of chained in or the, the group of prisoners are chained in a cave and, and they can't see the outside of the cave or the where the light is. They just 
the light comes in and it casts shadows upon a wall in front of them. And they take those shadows to be the reality because that's all they've been exposed to. And then uh, one day one of them breaks free and goes out and sees the real world and with all its color and sights and sounds. And, and he's so excited about this truth that he's seen that he comes back to the cave to tell the rest of the prisoners there and is basically killed because they don't want to hear it. And I, <laughs> I, I felt in some respects like that because... I felt like I was the only one who knew this stuff because, I mean, not as you pointed out, there weren't many people that were, you know, entrusted and it was their job, essentially, to spend eight hours a day for five years uh, with Bruce Lee or with his writings. I mean, you kind of felt like his pen pal, right? You'd see things and see references and uh, sections that he'd underlined in books that would obviously had impacted him. So you come to know a person's mind very well, and uh, it was a tremendous education for me. It really was. I mean, it was like the equivalent of getting a Ph.D. in junk fanology, you know, and uh, hmm. I, I learned a lot about, about Bruce Lee, about how his mind was operating, and I was very impressed with it. There was not one thing that I came away with from that that diminished him in my eyes, and that's rare, you know, because, like I say, with most of our, our heroes in the 20th and 21st century, there's usually something where you think, oh, well, you know, I can't go there with him on that one. Um, <laughs> yeah. Bruce Lee, it was, it was just the opposite. Everything that we as fans in the 70s had hoped for uh, were realized there. He was, and and, and I, that sounds like I'm deifying him, and I don't want to do that, but he was a, um, a very actualized human being, and that's rare. Uh, he's not the only one who's probably been fully actualized, but... I mean, his packaging was the most attractive. It was a very bright meteor that went across the sky when Bruce Lee sort of came into our universe, and, and it was fascinating to watch. But it was neat that there was a depth there, um, which you don't yeah. see with a Jet Li or a Jackie Chan or a Jean-Claude Van Damme or Steven Seagal. You know, Bruce Lee would have been a fascinating guy to spend time with. I mean, I remember Ted Wong and Herb Jackson would come to my house, and we'd start talking, and we'd pour over you know photocopies I then had of his notes and we talked till four in the morning, you know, and Herb particularly had to go to work at like 6 a.m. the next day, and he was a steel worker, so, but it was just, you can imagine what it would have been like to spend time with this guy, I mean, he could talk to you about art, philosophy, culture, uh, fighting, physical fitness, muscle development, film, uh, this was a fascinating individual, and I mean, anything you see, if you ever see him in an interview, he's tremendously charismatic, and uh, there's just so few people like that that one encounters in one's lifetime. I'm almost speechless on trying to describe it or to frame it. Um, <laughs> I mean, we meet people like that occasionally. Um, so when they do come by, they're pretty special, and it's it's always worth um, finding out a little bit more about what they have to say or tell us. So I was, yeah, I was very fortunate. I got a great education and learned a lot about a very impressive guy. And it's interesting that other cultures have embraced him too. I mean, I'm I'm in Canada, and there's a statue of him in Bosnia. Uh, I mean, hmm. I thought that. You know, um, and how many millions of people did he inspire to look a little deeper into things like martial arts? I mean, you got into martial arts largely through Bruce. I got into it mm -hmm. through Bruce. And there's a lot of martial artists that um, have very good livings these days that really ought to be tithing something to Bruce Lee for uh, his contribution to that. And it's kind of ironic that uh, as the kid watching Enter the Dragon in the theater just like I was. I was 20 that year. You were younger. But now your name is linked with Bruce Lee's as long as people will be reading books. Well, as a footnote, maybe. Uh, I, don't, <laughs> I have no delusions on that ground. Um, I was just fortunate to be able to do it. And I, th yeah. I think at the time I was really, I was tired of people trying to represent him. Because as a fan, I wanted to hear from him. You know, I wanted, I wanted as close as possible a direct communicate from Bruce Lee, not, you know, not someone's interpretation of it. Because typically if someone offers you their interpretation, they're selling something. And I, I got so tired of that, you know, this is what Bruce did. And, and all it was was a huge morass. You know, there wasn't, there was nothing clear and this was not a complicated man. So it was neat to just say, you know what, I don't want to hear from anyone else. I want to hear from Bruce. And thank God, Linda kept all of his materials because that allowed him to communicate. I, I basically just fashioned the platform that he was able to speak from, but other martial artists would, you know, go public and uh, try and advance themselves by putting him down, which I, I thought was 
beneath them. I mean, you've, you've probably seen it too. I mean, they, they, there's a love-hate relationship with Bruce Lee in the martial arts world. You know, people love what he was able to do. There's a certain uh, envy of his talent, which was hard fought uh, to achieve. But there's a resentment that uh, people, I think at some level, don't feel they measure up, or maybe they're not working as hard as they could to fully realize themselves as Bruce Lee did. And so you have to put them down. And uh, mm. none of those statements from people that have put them down to me have, have been credible. Um, they're usually people that are selling something, doing their own movies. And it's, it's funny, I mean, you can watch these other movies uh, with, you know, and, and anyone. I mean, you and I could take a 16 millimeter camera and, and film a, a martial arts sequence that we expertly choreograph and we could look like champions. But when, once you watch it, there's not that same integrity to it that Bruce Lee's had. And I think that's why they stand up after almost 40 years. You know, we keep watching them and re-watching them, and there was an energy and an honesty to it. You actually believed he was doing what he was doing. Yeah. Thank you very much, John, for talking with me. It's oh, been a, just a pleasure. No, my pleasure as well. I've, uh, I haven't actually spoken uh, about Bruce Lee in a number of years, so it was nice to let the genie out of the bottle again. All right. Well, thank you. Have a good you day. Too.